Hi, it's Katrina. Moloch and the Ancient Bull There is no pagan deity quite as despised by nearly every biblical prophet and Roman senator as Moloch. Moloch was the Canaanite god of child sacrifice. He had a bronze body with a furnace in his belly which was used for roasting children. The people who worshipped this awful deity were known as the cult of Moloch, and it's been said, although no real physical evidence has ever been found, that they boiled children alive inside of an enormous bronze statue. The statue had the body of a man and the head of a bull, and archaeologists are trying to search for clues of actual sacrifice. The Canaanites were not the only ancient people who worshipped a great bull god, nor were they the only ones who practiced human sacrifice. In Carthage, what is now Tunisia, child sacrifice was so common that they had a sacred grove and a temple dedicated to their god Baal Hamon. Archaeological excavations in the 1920s uncovered evidence of child sacrifice in the region. Moving over to ancient Egypt, they worshipped a bull deity named Apis. He was actually one of the very first gods to be associated with an animal, originally worshipped about 5,000 years ago. But unlike the bull god of the Canaanites, Apis wasn't so murderous. He instead represented the peaceful balance of the universe. Some believe the Canaanites took the idea of Apis and twisted it into their terrifying god, Moloch. Danish Dogs in South America Vikings may very well have been in South America about 400 years before the Spanish. The evidence is shaky, but it is possible. One of the biggest contributors to this strange theory has to do with dogs. In 1885, researchers discovered a very specific variety of sheepdogs buried in an Inca grave. These dogs had been buried beside their mummified humans. This is because prior to the conquest of South America, it was fairly common for groups like the Inca to be buried with their best canine friends. Now here comes the coincidence. French scientists Madeleine Friant and H. Reichlin did an analysis of the sheepdog and found it not to be a descendant of wild South American dogs. Instead, it was directly related to the same dogs which have been discovered buried in Denmark, where the Vikings lived 1,000 years ago. According to these researchers, anatomical coincidence is anything but. These dogs are the same, there is no doubt about it. The big question now is trying to figure out how Danish dogs reached South America before the Spanish. The only reasonable explanation seems to be that it was the Vikings who brought them although this hasn't been proven beyond any doubt. The Spanish in Canada Captain James Cook reached the west coast of North America in 1778. He sailed from England to what is now British Columbia and was thought to be the first foreigner to touch down in the soon-to-be country of Canada. But part of that story might be wrong. It may have actually been Spanish explorers who reached British Columbia first, and they may have been killed by Native Americans in the Okanagan Valley. For a long time, this theory has been a fringe conspiracy theory with locals in the valley. But more recently, archaeological evidence has turned the conspiracy theory into an unusual coincidence. For example, a Spanish sword from the 16th century was discovered buried in British Columbia. And unless that sword was dumped there coincidentally many years later, it would mean that Spanish explorers really arrived in North America 500 years ago. According to Dr. Stan Kopp from Langara College, it's 100% plausible. Historical records show that Spanish explorers did in fact reach Alaska in the 1700s, but overland expeditions never went farther north along the interior than Colorado or Arkansas. Dr. Stan Kopp says the legend is that Spanish explorers traveled up the Columbia River from the Oregon coast, wintered in Kelowna, then were ambushed by native warriors as they tried to head back south. And considering the sword that was discovered in British Columbia, this could have been a real thing. All archaeologists need now are the bodies of those lost explorers to confirm it. The Tower of Babel The Tower of Babel, according to the Bible, was built by united humanity. Everyone had gotten together in harmony to build a massive tower that would reach heaven. God, angry that humanity thought they could just work together and build a giant walkway to heaven, destroyed the tower. Not only that, he broke apart humanity's single language into dozens of languages so that the people of Earth could no longer communicate with one another. God made it impossible for all humans to communicate through one central language. But here's the thing about the Tower of Babel. It wasn't only talked about in the Bible. The Quran has an almost identical story, but with slight differences. They don't mention the tower by name, saying only that an impressive construction was built in Egypt by the pharaoh so that he could climb to heaven and talk to God. 
But things get really crazy when we turn to Central America. They have an almost identical story in which a giant named Xelhua built the Great Pyramid of Cholula, which is an actual place and the biggest pyramid in the world to storm heaven. But when the gods learned of the giant's plan, they destroyed the pyramid and fractured the language of the builders so that they could no longer communicate. This is almost identical to the biblical narrative, which is surprising considering the distance between these cultures. The Mesoamericans of Central America had nothing to do with the Babylonians or Judeans 2,000 years ago. So I want to give a big shout out to Carmeline Nash and Shakia. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Gobekli Tepe and Easter Island There is a very interesting question that scientists and archaeologists could never answer. That question is, why are there humanoid statues at prehistoric sites all over the world with almost the same posture? These are statues all the way from Gobekli Tepe in Turkey to the statues of Easter Island. Many of these fantastic statues have very similar symbolic stances, almost as if the sculptors were inspired by the same things. Gobekli Tepe is one of the most mysterious archaeological sites that we know about. It dates back to 9600 BC and comprises unbelievably advanced architecture. There were also gigantic statues built here by people who didn't have sophisticated tools. The faces may not be clear on these statues, but they are obviously not human. They're gods, goddesses, or maybe even visitors from above. The statues on Easter Island are significantly newer. These were erected as recently as 500 years ago, and yet they look surprisingly similar to the statues carved at Gobekli Tepe over 12,000 years ago. It's highly unlikely that the Easter Islanders were a bunch of copycats. And even if these statues aren't exactly the same, their positions are the same. Standing tall, hands at the belly, a very distinct pose. Others like it have been found in Bolivia at Tiwanaku. We don't know why so many cultures made strikingly similar statues throughout history, but it does almost seem as if they came into contact with beings, human or otherwise, who looked identical. Do you think the posture is the same? Why do you think it is? Let me know in the comments below. The Ancient Network There is a pretty interesting claim floating around that says Stone Age people created an enormous underground network of tunnels 12,000 years ago. These tunnels were supposedly used as ancient superhighways to connect various civilizations all the way from Scotland on the island of Britain to Turkey on the border of Europe and Asia. According to German archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Kusk, there is evidence of this mysterious tunnel system if you know where to look for it. In Bavaria, archaeologists discovered an underground tunnel about 2,100 feet long. That's about twice as long as the Eiffel Tower is tall. In Austria, they found another one about 1,000 feet long. This is not for the claustrophobic. Most of these tunnels are only wide enough for one person to slowly slide through. There are all kinds of tunnels hidden underneath ancient Neolithic settlements. The only problem is that these tunnels don't actually connect. Most are just random tunnels a few hundred feet long, looking like enormous gopher holes. Still, Dr. Kusk insists they once formed a complex network like an underground ant nest across all of mainland Europe. How in the world they dug all of it by hand is harder to explain. Most archaeologists believe these tunnels were just niches used by local villagers to escape in times of violence. But seeing as they are indeed ancient, it's hard to prove or disprove any specific theory. The Lady of Elche the Lady of Elche was discovered in 1897 in Spain. This location is now a famous archaeological site called La Alcudia. This is a sculpture of a woman carved intricately out of limestone. Archaeologists believe it dates back to the 4th century BC, yet nobody knows exactly who she was supposed to represent. One theory is that she was the embodiment of an ancient deity known as Tanit, worshipped in Carthage. Tanit and her good friend Baal Hamon were the two most important gods in Carthage. She was a goddess of both war and fertility. But here's where things get tricky. In the Louvre Museum in Paris, there is an artifact from the 4th century BC that looks a lot like the Lady of Elche. But this artifact came from very far away, from West Bengal in India. The artifact isn't a sculpture, but a small terracotta plaque with the image of a woman on it. This woman not only looks like the Lady of Elche, but has the same hairdo and everything. They could be twins, and yet they were found worlds apart. The artifact in the museum is a depiction of ladies with auspicious hairpins. They were Indian goddesses of war and battle, just like Tanit in Carthage was the goddess of war. 
Whether this is just a coincidence, or if the goddesses are linked, historians don't know. The true identity of the Lady of Elche is also still a mystery. Dolphins in Gaza A statue from 2,000 years ago recently surfaced during archaeological excavations near Kibbutz Magen, which is near the Gaza Strip. The statue is of a dolphin clutching a fish in its mouth. It was discovered in the ruins of an old Byzantine site and was crafted during the era of the Romans. It stands only about six inches high and was probably part of a larger sculpture. It may even have been a part of a gigantic statue depicting a god or goddess, probably incorporated into a much newer building prior to the whole thing being mostly destroyed. Researchers say the statue could be a depiction of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who according to legend was born from sea foam. Or it could be Poseidon, lord of all the seas. The mystery now is that nobody knows how such a statue ended up all the way over near the Gaza Strip. Sure, there was a temple to Aphrodite in the ancient port city of Ashkelon, but not here. Somebody must have taken the statue from somewhere else, brought it to this old Byzantine town, and then incorporated it into their own decorations. But how and why is still completely unknown. Egyptians and the Maya The Egyptians and the Maya never met. These people lived thousands of years apart and thousands of miles apart. As far as history is concerned, it was impossible for either civilization to have had an impact or an influence on the other. And yet they have an amazing number of similarities, starting with the pyramids. Over 2,000 years after the Egyptians built their pyramids, the Maya built their own. It was part of both people's cultural identities. But whereas the Egyptians used their pyramids for tombs, the Maya used theirs as temples and for ceremonies. They used the pyramids for totally different things, but it's still amazing to think they built similar structures, pulling the idea out of thin air. And then there's the hieroglyphics. Both these people developed a series of handwriting that used glyphs and pictures that convey an important meaning. But yet again, the hieroglyphics were different for each culture. For the Egyptians, you read the script from left to right, but for the Maya, you read it in a zigzag pattern. One pair of glyphs, then down to the next glyphs, then back up to the next two. This really confused researchers because they were trying to read the script left to right when that was all wrong. Both these cultures probably came up with all this stuff on their own, with no influence from some divine third party. It's just a major coincidence that with architecture, writing, and even religion, these two cultures were practically twins. What do all early civilizations have in common? Almost every ancient civilization had five things in common. These aren't necessarily coincidences so much as they are the basic building blocks of human civilization. In the Paleolithic Age, in the millennia following the end of the Ice Age, human beings were hunters and gatherers. They looked for plants, hunted animals, and wandered around following the seasons. The Neolithic Age changed all of that, and human society evolved. Nearly every early civilization on Earth started when they figured out how to plant their own food and domesticate animals. Goats, cows, pigs. Most crops were things like wheat, beans, and maize. Around this same time, most societies formed a hierarchy of power. People lived in groups of between 20 and 30 until they figured out farming. This was when groups of humans began moving into the triple digits. This was also when people realized somebody needed to be in charge, and this led to war and power struggles. The third thing civilizations had in common was industry. People had food now and had a safe place to sleep, so they started trading their extra goods to create commerce. Pieces of pottery, shiny jewels, clothing, and weapons. Then comes the architecture. Every major society went from living in huts and caves to actual houses. And then when religion came about, as it did in most places on the planet, humans began building impressive monuments to their gods and goddesses. Oddly enough, most of the early civilizations worshipped the same things. There was a goddess of fertility, rain, agriculture, and so on. And as time went on and society advanced, they came up with more deities to reflect their growing view of the world. The Curse of the Mummy When archaeologists recently unearthed 168 sarcophagi from an Egyptian necropolis, they discovered something shocking. Some tombs that had been holding the sarcophagi were found to contain curses. Mummy curses that were inscribed into the walls of these dark underground burial chambers. And these curses were not very friendly. These discoveries were made in Saqqara. It's an ancient city of the dead, a monumental burial ground where hundreds upon hundreds of mummies have been found buried in boxes, both above and below the sand. 
The over 160 coffins were only recently uncovered over a three-month period, and this is after decades of research. Egyptologist Salima Ikram said that the curses found inscribed in the tombs are mostly there to deter trespassers, a warning to people who wanted to desecrate the mummies and steal their stuff. One of these curses was found in the tomb of the royal vizier Ankhmahor, who was a counselor to a pharaoh 4,000 years ago. The curse states that if any damage is done to his tomb, the same damage will be done to the culprit's property. It also warns that the vizier has secret knowledge of magic and spells, which will curse the trespasser with the fear of seeing ghosts. And there are other curses too, like ones that threaten any who trespass will have their neck wrung like a goose. The Lady of El Miron Inside a tomb over 18,000 years old, archaeologists have discovered a hidden message. It was found at a gravesite in northern Spain, where a mysterious woman called the Red Lady of El Miron was buried around 18,700 years ago. The woman's remains were originally discovered next to a block colored in red ochre pigment. She was buried with flowers, alongside thousands of stone artifacts and scattered animal bones. It's an important burial site because it's the very first one ever found from the Magdalenian Age on the Iberian Peninsula. The Magdalenian Age covers from 19,000 to 11,000 years ago. The woman died between the age of 35 and 40, and now recent excavations have discovered what archaeologists think is her tombstone. It's a large limestone block that features a triangular engraving which has led to the most recent mystery. Archaeologists say it's meant to represent the female pubic bone. It's a hidden message that scientists don't fully understand. We know this was a very important woman in her community, perhaps the leader. But why a pelvic bone was left carved into her tombstone is anyone's guess. It could have been some kind of symbol of female power, but researchers are kind of confused. Tomb of the Prophet In Iraq, archaeologists were recently documenting a series of ancient tombs from the kingdom of Nineveh. While they were looking around, they discovered that a tunnel had been dug underneath a tomb that supposedly belonged to the biblical prophet Jonah. When archaeologists dug deeper into the tunnel, they found writings on the walls, including inscriptions written in the ancient Neo-Assyrian language. One of these messages is quite fascinating. Researchers have translated it to read, The Palace of Ershadon, Strong King, King of the World, King of Assyria, Governor of Babylon, King of Sumer and Akkad, King of the Kings of Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, and Kush. Clearly, this guy had quite a lot of titles. If what's written on the wall is to be believed, the Assyrian king Esarhaddon was the king of pretty much everyone. One of the most remarkable things is that he was allegedly the king of Kush, a mysterious ancient kingdom located south of Egypt in Nubia, which back then would have been a world away from the region of Mesopotamia. Other inscriptions were found here basically describing the king surrounding, conquering, plundering, demolishing, destroying, and burning all the cities which stood against him. However, it's unclear what the king has to do with the biblical prophet Jonah. The inscriptions were found underneath Jonah's tomb in a tunnel, which had been blown apart by ISIS in 2014. Jonah is in the Quran as a preacher in the city of Nineveh and was supposedly swallowed by a giant whale. Helicopter Hieroglyphs In the temple of Seti I, Marqaz al-Belina, Egypt, there is a strange set of hieroglyphics inscribed on the wall. It's an ancient Egyptian frieze that appears to show proof of highly advanced technology and perhaps even contact with beings from another world. A frieze is an area of sculpted or painted decoration, usually on a wall. These inscriptions are considered by some to be out of place and to be evidence of otherworldly business in ancient Egypt. And yet to some, they are just ordinary hieroglyphics that have been wildly misinterpreted. Here's what makes the inscription so unique. The engravings show what appears to be a helicopter, a submarine, and several airplanes. Of course, these modern pieces of machinery aren't perfect interpretations. They look like a child's messy drawings of helicopters and submarines. Still, the resemblance is uncanny. It's made some believe that the Egyptians were visited by time travelers, who, for some bizarre reason, brought helicopters and submarines with them, or had been given a glimpse into the future by some unknown magic. Mainstream archaeologists say the carvings are nothing unusual at all. Instead, people are just seeing patterns that aren't there. 
The real explanation for the helicopter has been solved thanks to digital imaging. Researchers have looked at the hieroglyphics and found that the helicopter is actually two completely separate pictures that were carved at different times. The original carving was made during the reign of the pharaoh Seti I. It read, He who repulses the nine enemies of Egypt. The inscription was remade under the reign of Ramses II to say, He who protects Egypt and overthrows foreign countries. The Tomb of Nestor's Cup Inside an ancient Greek tomb from 2,800 years ago, archaeologists found an intriguing artifact called Nestor's Cup. The cup is fascinating because of an inscription on the clay vessel. According to researchers from Brown University, the text on the cup says roughly, I am Nestor's cup, good to drink from. Whoever drinks this cup empty will be seized by desire for the beautifully crowned goddess Aphrodite. This inscription is supposed to be a jest, a comical reference to the legendary King Nestor, who was a character in Homer's famous epic poems The Iliad and the Odyssey. In the story, Nestor drinks from a giant golden chalice with the magical power to restore his strength. Of course, this cup probably held no kind of magical concoction, but it's still an important artifact because its inscription is one of the oldest known examples of the Greek alphabet being written in the Euboean alphabet. But who exactly was buried in this tomb? It's been a mystery because researchers first thought that it was a child buried with this strange artifact, but a more recent analysis showed that what researchers thought were children's bones were actually the bones of three human adults. What the cup and its inscription have to do with these people is still unknown. What do you think the cup and its inscriptions could mean? Let me know in the comments below. The Nazareth Inscription The Nazareth Inscription was supposedly the Roman response to finding Jesus' tomb empty after the resurrection 2,000 years ago. It's also called the Nazareth Decree, and it's a huge marble slab carved with an edict that was issued by the Roman Emperor Caesar. The declaration on the slab is a warning that anyone caught robbing a grave will be given severe punishment. That's pretty much all it says. It's a warning to potential grave robbers. Nobody actually knows where this slab came from. Its first documented sighting was when it came to Paris in 1878, sold by a German collector named Wilhelm Froner. He didn't leave any notes on where he'd originally acquired it, so its origins are still a mystery. The translation was done in 1930, and it's been dated to sometime between the year 100 BC and 100 AD, the time when Jesus supposedly lived and died. Since nobody can say for sure, one of the dominant theories is that the Roman authorities carved this marble warning and put it in front of Jesus' tomb. This was after they heard his disciples predicting his body would arise with his divine resurrection. This could very well be evidence that Jesus died, was entombed, and then his body miraculously vanished. The Bloody Curse Another terrifying curse was discovered in a tomb, this time in Israel. The curse, as if an ordinary curse wasn't scary enough, was painted in what looks like blood. It was left on a small rock tablet and buried in a tomb at the Beit Shearim Necropolis in Lower Galilee. According to researchers at the University of Haifa and the Israel Antiquities Authority, this particular catacomb was unknown until 2021. Archaeologists broke through the surface and began digging around, and that was when they found the curse. It was the first of its kind to be found in this huge necropolis for 65 years. This was a Jewish settlement between the 2nd and 5th centuries AD, populated after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was one of the major centers for Jewish learning and culture after they almost went extinct at the hands of the Romans. The inscription was written in Greek and not in blood, but in red paint. It has eight lines of warning, but the message is pretty clear. It says Jacob the proselyte vows to curse anybody who would open this grave, so nobody will open it. Not that spooky, but still fascinating, especially because of the word proselyte. This was a title given to those who converted to Judaism from either Christianity or one of the major pagan cults of the day, such as the cult of Isis or the cult of Mithras. Early ABCs Thomas Schneider from the University of British Columbia recently studied a 3,400-year-old inscription found inside an Egyptian tomb. He discovered that this primitive chunk of limestone could very well be the earliest example of an alphabetical sequence. Three of the words start with the letters B, C, and D, and the rest of the tablet is broken and indecipherable. 
Each of the words is accompanied by a symbol in front of the letters, since that was how early Egyptian hieroglyphic writing worked. But it's amazing because when everything is put together, it reads like a mnemonic device. For example, A is for apple, B is for banana, C is for cantaloupe, you get it. Researchers believe this may have been used by early Egyptians as a kind of learning tool to help them with learning their own alphabet. The message on Howard Carter's grave. Possibly no curse in history has been more terrifying than the one discovered in Tutankhamun's tomb when it was found in 1922. Howard Carter was the one who discovered the resting place of the boy king from the 19th dynasty, who ruled over the new kingdom and was the very last of his royal family to hold power. Howard Carter broke open the seal to the boy's tomb after it was found in the Valley of the Kings. The curse was allegedly unleashed on all of those who were involved, and quite a few of the main players in that excavation did indeed have miserable lives afterward. But we're not here today to talk about this particular curse. Rather, this is about an inscription that can be found today on Howard Carter's own grave. When Howard started rooting through the tomb, he found a lot of good stuff. Hundreds of artifacts, gold figurines, an absolute wealth of treasure. But Carter's very favorite artifact was a mysterious cup with an inscription written on it. It's now known as the Lotus Chalice, and it's one of the most valuable artifacts from ancient Egypt. It took some time after the discovery, but the writing on the chalice was finally translated. Howard Carter loved the message so much that he made sure that when he died, the entire thing was transcribed on his tombstone. It says, May your spirit live, may you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your eyes beholding happiness. The Mysterious Tomb of Roxana At an ancient Greek tomb in northern Macedonia, researchers discovered paintings on a group of columns. According to the culture minister Kostas Tasoulas, the columns of the ancient tomb of Amphipolis were cleaned to reveal paintings. These paintings may just help solve the mystery of who is buried here. This is one of the biggest tombs in all of ancient Greece, built back in the days of Alexander the Great, but we don't know who it was for. And just before the mysterious paintings were found inside, a skeleton was unearthed beneath. It wasn't a simple thing to find either. Researchers had to dig through the floor, past giant statues of sphinxes, then break through a solid wall into a hidden antechamber. The chamber was decorated with beautiful mosaics, and there in the dark was a body. This body had been lying undisturbed in total darkness for about 2,300 years. This probably wasn't Alexander's tomb, something that still has never been found. But there is a very good chance that the person found buried underneath this place was Roxana, Alexander's Persian wife. She was one of the most important women in Greek history, Alexander's trusted partner as he conquered the known world until he died at the young age of 32. And while there weren't any hidden messages or inscriptions for clues, researchers think the paintings could help with the identity of the body. In the mysterious paintings found above the tomb, there is a woman shown who seems to be of great importance. This woman in the paintings could very well be Roxana. Mysterious Blocks A woman named Tracy Williams was walking along the beach in Cornwall, England in 2012 when she spotted something strange in the sand. She inspected the mysterious object a bit closer and was shocked to see that she was staring at dark tablets that had been buried on the beach. Still, she wasn't an archaeologist, and so the woman left the blocks alone and kept on going. But a few weeks later, she came across another tablet on a different beach, and it was the exact same thing. As it turned out, she wasn't the only one who was finding these tablets or blocks. It's been going on for decades, all across Europe. The phenomenon has been experienced by many people, and these blocks have come to be known as the Jipetir blocks. Williams was eager to get to the bottom of the mystery. She did some investigating and learned that the word Jipetir, which is written on all the blocks, was actually the name of a village in Indonesia. And in the 19th century, the village was home to a plantation. The plantation was responsible for making plates from the gum of the palakum tree. These plates were a kind of rubbery latex material which could be used in the manufacturing of toys, surgical equipment, furniture, and underwater telegraph cables. It was an incredibly important substance, and it was shipped all over the globe. Our best guess is that the blocks came from a sunken ship. We know that in 1912, the Titanic had these Gipetir blocks in its cargo hold. And so, these blocks could be actual lost cargo from the Titanic, 
which sank over 100 years ago. Venomous Serpent Matt Gamir has spent a lot of time at the beach. He's seen plenty of sharks, all kinds of stingrays, and all the weird beach behavior that you can expect to encounter in San Diego. But in April of 2022, Matt encountered a whole different kind of animal, and it almost killed him. Matt has lived in San Diego his whole life and is a major surfer. He and his buddies were at one of their favorite spots, South Torrey Pines Beach, when Matt was attacked by a vicious rattlesnake. What makes the whole thing kind of ironic is that Matt had just gotten out of the water because he spotted a shark nearby. He didn't want to get bit by a shark, so he paddled his way back to shore and walked up the beach. And that was when he was bit on his foot by a snake. According to what Matt told the news, it felt like someone had dropped a knife directly on the top of his foot. But here's the thing. Matt didn't just get bit once. He got chomped on five times by the rattlesnake. He might have been better off with the shark. Within seconds, he could feel the effects of the venom. Tingling in the lips and face, numbness and swelling, Matt had to be rushed to the nearest hospital and treated with vials of anti-venom. Matt survived, but it was an extremely close call. One bite from a rattlesnake is dangerous enough, never mind getting five rapid doses of venom. The snake was pretty small, and so it was probably only a juvenile diamondback of one and a half feet. If it had been a full-grown snake, Matt might be dead by now. Giant Squid In spring of 2022, an extraordinarily rare sea monster was spotted washed up on a beach in South Africa. Beachcombers made the find of a lifetime when they came across a very real giant squid. This is a creature that lives in the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean and is so elusive only a handful of them have ever been seen by human eyes. The squid that washed up on Long Beach was about seven feet from the top of its head to the tips of its tentacles, making it a pretty small giant squid. Because as you may already know, these are some of the largest invertebrates in the world. Adult giant squids can grow to be 43 feet long, roughly five times the size of this one that washed up on the beach. So what made this rare discovery possible? It's kind of sad. Judging by the enormous gash on the squid, just above its tentacles, it appears to have been hit by the propeller of a boat. It might not have recovered from its injury and ended up being pushed onto the beach with the rising tide. Mysterious Ancient Arrowhead On a beach in Ireland, Dara Kenny uncovered a Neolithic artifact while digging in the sand. Dara is only seven years old and had no idea that his aimless digging would turn him into an amateur archaeologist. And yet that's exactly what happened. The young kid managed to pull out a flint arrowhead from the sand, an artifact dated at 5,000 years old. The boy was out in the countryside with his family for a weekend camping trip at Dunworley Beach in West Cork. Dara and his mom went down to the beach when the tide retreated. Dara wanted to find some shells, maybe a fossil or two, but he came across the artifact instead. Once the family got home, they emailed the National Museum of Ireland with pictures of their discovery. Museum officials confirmed that the arrowhead appeared to be from roughly 3000 BC to 2700 BC. That's even older than Stonehenge. Maeve Sikora at the museum praised the little boy's discovery and even invited him back to the museum to see his arrowhead on display. As for where the ancient artifact came from, that's a bit more complicated. It was probably used by the Neolithic people of Ireland, but nobody knows for sure. It may have come from across the water in England, pushed onto the beach after being lost somewhere else. All we know for sure is that it was a very old hunting tool, used by primitive humans who almost definitely lived in a cave. Lost Treasure Chest A woman in Norfolk, United Kingdom, found herself a treasure. I'm not talking about a beach treasure of seashells and sand dollars. Jenny Fitzgerald discovered a literal treasure chest on the beach that was filled with riches. It was a dream come true. A wealth of coins, gems, artifacts, and jewelry. And she found it because she had taken it upon herself to clean the trash off the beach. As if being a good citizen wasn't enough, Jenny went and earned herself a very real treasure. She was out with the North Norfolk Beach Cleans Group, sifting through the sand for garbage, when she thought she saw a piece of driftwood. Then she realized it was actually a wooden box. It was fairly small, only about 10 inches long, but when she opened it, the small treasure chest contained over 100 gold coins, a sack full of gems, an antique pocket watch, and a priceless signet ring. The coins are perhaps the most interesting part of the discovery. Some are Victorian, some date from the reign of King George III, and there are even some medieval growths. But most shocking of all is that some of the coins appear to be Roman. 
meaning the treasure has a history stretching back 2,000 years. Unfortunately for the accidental treasure hunter, she's not going to make any money off her discovery. The chest was handed over to the Norfolk County Council, and if they find it to be of historical value, then chances are all those coins and treasure will be stuffed into a museum, and Jenny won't make very much money. So I wanted to give a big shout out to Barbara Sorgdracker and Bill Shepard. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe for more videos about amazing discoveries. Giant Millipedes On a beach in Howick, located in the north of England, a group of friends discovered something fascinating and also a little terrifying. They were on a geological road trip in January of 2018. The plan was to travel from England to Wales while looking at geological formations along the coastline and searching for potential fossils. Lo and behold, they ended up discovering the remains of a millipede-like beast that lived 326 million years ago. The fossils were found on the beach cliffs and would honestly be invisible to anyone who wasn't trained to look for this type of thing. People have been visiting this beach for years and nobody ever realized there were monsters imprinted on the rocks. Now for the monster itself, which was something nightmares are made out of. It was basically a centipede the size of an alligator. It lived 100 million years before dinosaurs did, back when this part of England was a hot jungle filled with gigantic insectoid creatures. They've since named it Arthropleura, and they say it was the biggest arthropod in the history of our planet. A truly Godzilla-sized monster. Giant Skull the giant skull of what appeared to be some kind of cosmic monster from outer space was discovered on a beach in New Jersey. It happened on Memorial Day of 2021, with the police having to come and remove it because it was causing such a commotion. The skull clearly belonged to an animal of some kind, and yet it looked like an extraterrestrial bird thing with two oblong eye sockets and a long pointy beak. The Island Beach State Park in Berkeley posted the photographs of the unexpected skull, which they said washed ashore after a storm. And after a whole lot of debate and speculation, it was the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection that finally identified the skull. Much to everyone's disappointment, it didn't actually come from a monster. It was the skull of an ordinary mink whale. It wasn't a pterodactyl head, and it didn't come from outer space. The big mystery remaining is why only the skull was found and not the rest of the whale. Ghost Tracks Railroad tracks from World War I were recently uncovered after a fierce coastal storm hit New Jersey. The storm shifted sand on the beach around, revealing a set of mysterious railroad tracks near Cape May. Nicknamed ghost tracks, they were actually used for sand mining and munitions testing. They had been revealed previously in 2014, the first time anyone saw them in 80 years, but they quickly vanished back under the sand. Now, with this latest storm, it looks like the tracks are here to stay a little longer. The Cape May Sand Company used this specific track from between 1905 and 1936. Trains used the track to take sand from the beach, bring it to their factory, and transform that natural sand into glass and cement. Some of the cement, according to local historian Ben Miller, was even used to build the Panama Canal, thousands of miles away in Central America. Prehistoric Fish on Revere Beach, Massachusetts, a prehistoric-looking fish was spotted by local resident Eric Hay. The animal was about five feet long, completely out of the water and beached on the sand. It also had a rope tied around its tail. According to what Eric told the Boston Globe, the creature looked exactly like a dinosaur. Not knowing what in the world he was dealing with, Eric posted a photo of the mystery monster online. Before long, two main guesses came forward. The fish was either a short-nosed sturgeon or an Atlantic sturgeon. Whatever the case, both of these fish are endangered species. They are so rare that any sighting should be reported to the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. To make this story even more tragic, the poor fish was still alive and breathing when Eric found it. And, rather than taking selfies with it, he did the right thing and tried to get it back into the water. Sadly, it was already out of steam and just ended up being pushed back onto the sand. What do you do with a dead whale? In 2012, a giant humpback whale washed up at Newport Beach in Sydney, Australia. The whale had likely been on its way to warmer waters when it died, then drifted along the current to the beach. It hit the sand, got stuck, and then, unfortunately for anyone close enough to smell it, started to rot. It was 35 feet from the tip of its tail to the end of its snout, roughly the same length as a London bus. 
Once the whale was on the beach, it immediately began to stink. In fact, there aren't really any words to describe the putrid, rotting whale carcass smell decaying on the sand. Wildlife authorities were called in to remove the creature. You might think being a wildlife worker is all tiger cubs and baby pandas, but that's not the case at all. These wildlife workers had to cut the humpback whale into five pieces and then lift them off the beach using heavy machinery. They had 20 tons of raw whale to get rid of, and the best tool they had at their disposal was a chainsaw. But the gory details aside, it was quite the tragedy for the whale. Experts believe the whale was a juvenile, and it had probably gotten sick and died about three days before it washed up on the beach. They don't know exactly what killed it, but believe it was some sort of whale sickness. Thanks for watching! What's the craziest thing you've ever found at the beach? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you later! Bye!